Hello, 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 young professionals. Thank you so much for joining us again at track two. And I really welcome you all to track two of the Power and Energy Society Young Professionals Regional Summit for USA and Canada. My name is Adedoyin Nolaji, Vice Chair PSYP, and I will be hosting this session. I hope you've had a very enlightening time so far with the keynote um, track and the technical track. In this track, we'll be having a professional development webinar on writing a successful academic and industry grant proposal. For our very first um, session today, in this track, we have the honor of having Dr. Anamika Dube. Dr. Anamika Dube is an assistant professor in the School of EECS at Washington State University, WSU, Pullman, and holds the Hugh Rogers Endowed Chair in Electrical Engineering at WSU. She also has a joint appointment as a research scientist with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, PNNL. Our research is focused on the model-based and data-driven methods to, um, for decision support in large-scale electric power distribution systems for improved efficiency, operational flexibility, and resilience. She is a recipient of the National Science Foundation Career Award in 2019, WSU ECS Early Career Award in 2020, WSU Voiland College of Engineering and Architecture, VCEA, Junior Faculty Research Award in 2021, WSU Pace Setter Award in Physical Sciences and Engineering in 2021. She serves as the Associate Editor for IEEE Transactions on Power Systems, IEEE Power Engineering Letters, and IEEE Access. She is the current secretary of IEEE PES Distribution Systems Analysis Subcommittee and IEEE University, and IEEE PES University Education Subcommittee and serves as PES chapter for the IEEE Polar section. Dr. Dube today will be talking about writing a successful academic grant proposal. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Dr. Dubé. Thank you, Ade, for kind introduction. It was long. Sorry for sending a long introduction. All right, so um, let, let me get started. And I assume I have 20 minutes to go over the topics, right? OK, great. So let me share my screen. OK. Um, can you all see the full screen mode? Yes, it's visible. Okay, awesome. All right. Um, hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be here. Thanks, Ade, for the invitation. And uh, um, as Ade said, I'll be talking about uh, writing a successful academic grant proposal based on my experiences as a, a faculty for past six years. And I have some tips uh, and, and some, some ideas or some concepts that I have learned over the years. And that's what I'm going to share with you. Uh, hopefully, it will help you all in your academic journey. So let's get started. Um, I think Ari already gave me a long enough introduction, so I'm going to skip some of these details. And I'm just going to briefly introduce what I do uh, in terms of research. Um, so my primary focus of research is at the power distribution level, looking into the changing nature and requirement of the grid, specifically at the edge interfacing. So what, what I mean by that is there are a lot of edge devices that are being integrated at the power grid, which is changing the nature of distribution systems from passive to a proactive and active. Um, simultaneously, our grid is also getting uh, challenged because of the changing requirement and nature due to decarbonization goals and due to also resiliency goals and changing climate, which is affecting our power grid infrastructures. So the question really is, is that how can we leverage these edge resources to provide resiliency and improve efficiency of our power grid, uh, uh, power grid uh, systems? And that's the question that I ask. And I primarily work in the area of answering the questions around modeling and optimization needed for the climate resilient 
power grids of the future. Some key topics that I work on involve disaster resiliency models for the power grid, specifically at the community and distribution level. That includes modeling of the weather fronts, that includes modeling of their impact at the grid level, and also how the operations get affected and how we can change those uh, operations to make the service more resilient during those extreme events. So that basically goes to resilient power grid operations, and that addresses the questions around how do we model the um, operation of the power grid when they are impacted by the extreme weather events? What are the uh, resources we have available? What are the visibility situational awareness challenges? How do we address those with the help of more data, more control at the at the edge? And then what can we do to basically use these edge devices to improve community resiliency? So that's a kind of nutshell or summary of what I do uh, and what I what my research is focused on. This is my um, happy research group. Uh, I and these are some of my sponsors who have uh, who I'm very grateful for funding and support. And I wanted to acknowledge them. Let's actually jump on to the topic of today's discussion. Um, and I'm, uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about how to write academic proposals uh, successful uh, based on my understanding of the academic proposal writing so far. So let's get started with the process first. And this is the slide is kind of summarizing what is the process, what is the step by step process to actually get to writing an academic proposal uh, for your idea that you want to get funded, that you want to do research on. So the first step is, of course, identify suitable funding opportunity. As an early career faculty um, or early professionals, there are some opportunities which are specifically there for early, and I'll talk about them towards the end. Figure out which of those funding opportunity is most suitable for the kind of work that you are doing. And uh, that is something that you can figure out through talking to your uh, colleagues, uh, talking, um, um, seeing and reading actually funding opportunity and figuring out whether that's a suitable, uh, generally suitable home for your work. Then uh, I, I guess this is a little bit uh, iterative, but uh, select a research idea. And when I say research idea, I uh, mean basically uh, an idea that you want to pursue within your field of expertise. And uh, the first point is really trying to figure out where does your field or your area submit their proposals, right? So now, now you're narrowing down the focus. You're trying to figure out, uh, you're trying to select a research idea. And uh, I'll speak to more about what are some of the criteria that I used to select a research idea. And maybe that's helpful for you. The next step is once you have a research idea, which is just more like a, you know, a, 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 um, based on your understanding of the, of the field and domain that you have, you develop a project story. And I'll talk about what I mean by project story. Then you run this project story by the program manager because you want to find a home for your proposal. Now, home for your proposal basically mean that within the funding and opportunities or, um, or the um, basically um, different uh, agencies, there are sub, uh, Directors or directors or divisions where you want to uh, submit your proposal, and the question really, really here is that where is your proposal going to sit the best? Then the next step is to write a strong and compelling proposal, and I'll talk more about it. Um, of course, recruit collaborators as needed. As early uh, faculty, most of the proposal that you will write will be single PI proposals. But if you're writing a collaborative proposal, there are still options to include collaborators for different things that you might need. Um, then the next step is get feedback from your collaborators, prepare all the supplementary documents, and then submit on time. So that's the overall uh, process of writing. Um, basically an academic proposal. And let me actually now zero in on some of these uh, topics. And these are just you know, some best practices that I have learned that has helped me refine my approach of writing a, an academic proposal. So selecting a research idea. So when you're writing a typ typically an early career grant, they are, um, they are typically open-ended and invite ambitious and impactful projects that have potential to transform the state of the art. So they are not, um, uh, typically they do not ask for you to work on a very specific idea. They are open-ended and uh, in the sense, uh, and depending upon what you want to do, you want to select a research idea that fits with your career goals as well as fits with the broader programmatic goals. So the steps I typically use when I was writing a single PI early career grant was first to figure out what do you want to do basically what do you think is the most one thing that can help you think about this question is that what do you think is the most important problem in your area for which you have expertise 
to solve. So you know you have to find that right balance uh, that you have the expertise to solve and you want to solve this problem and this problem is important for your field. So ask that question. That question requires, of course, talking to um, you, uh, talking to your colleagues, talking to your mentors. Also, in case of PES, talking to industry so that you can figure out what the industry impact of your idea is. Is it an is it a compelling concept for someone to eventually use it? Of course, your proposal, since it's academic in nature, it could be more. Uh, 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 it doesn't have to solve an immediate problem, but it should be solving a broader problem within your community, and it should be useful for someone eventually in the future. So that's one of the things to identify. Uh, that's the research idea. Then think about that whether this idea fits within the broader program programmatic goals of the funding opportunity. So, for example, if you're writing a proposal for NSF, NSF focuses on fundamental science. So you have to ask this question that this idea that you are trying to uh, work on, does it require fundamental scientific advancement? What are those fundamental scientific advancement? Are they innovative enough? Are they uh, creative enough compared to what the current state of the art is? Then uh, the next question also to think about is does the requirements for the merit, what are the requirements for merit review criteria and how does the program defines innovation and impact? So the way you are thinking about your research idea and the way the program thinks about innovation and impact, is there an overlap? Can you make a strong case for that overlap? Then you do you have background and resources to accomplish your goal? That is very important. And that kind of also encompasses the fact that are you the right person to solve this problem? And that uh, asks basically this question that do you have prior work on this particular area? Do you have have you done something to you know test your some of the hypotheses that you have formulated for this particular problem? And finally, I think this is one of the most crucial question is, what are your career goals and whether this idea will really contribute to your broader career goals. And the reason I'm saying is that because, you know, some of the early career grants that you will be writing are basically going to be the stepping stone for as your career develops in future. So think about it, what your broader career goals are. What do you want to do? Are you the right person to do it? And does it fit within the broader prog programmatic goal of the funding opportunity to select a research idea? And one key point will also be that talk to your community, talk to industry, talk to your mentors. Uh, for example, I think since I have limited time, I'm going to be a little bit fast here, but let's take an example of NSF Career Award. So they have two primary merit review criteria. One is intellectual merit, which basically um, uh, says that the proposal should advance the knowledge or have the potential to advance the knowledge, make basic fundamental scientific contribution, and broader impacts is the second criteria, which says that it, uh, it, the proposal should be able to benefit the society and um, have, um, you know, um, specific societal outcomes which are you know useful to your community your um, society in general you know those kind of questions so the point is for you to think about your research idea and think how it addresses these two specific merit review criteria and a little bit of detailed merit review criteria as well and this is just an example for the nsf career award similar things are there for other awards as well that you will um, you will basically um, want to apply for so you should take a careful look at the merit review criteria for the funding opportunity you're applying for and see how your story or research idea basically fits with the merit review criteria and whether it fits or not. So that's one, one thing to think about before you're starting to write. Then the second stage is develop a project story. This is not a full proposal. This is just a two-page draft. And I always uh, like an overview figure because you know a picture is worth 1,000 words. So develop a project story and the project story uh, this this is what help has helped me to develop a narrative that i find to be uh, helpful in developing the full proposal eventually and also communicating what i'm what i'm trying to do so think from the perspective of needs and motivation why do you need to solve this problem why does community need to solve the problem why this problem hasn't been solved yet what are the main research gaps right think from that perspective then uh, construct some research questions all the proposals or academic proposals that you will be working on will have this requirement for generating new knowledge so think about what are the scientific barriers that is stopping from solving this problem as of now how uh, what will it take to address those research gap what is the new knowledge that is needed right so think about uh, those questions 
and try to construct some research questions in your mind. And these research questions should be along the lines that they can actually, if you solve them, they should be able to meet the scientific barriers that you have, you know, discussed before. Then think about the uh, approach, like how you are going to solve these research questions. So define specific objectives for uh, that can address your specific research question. And but as you are developing these concepts, think about how these specific objectives that you're developing is able to accomplish the main project goal. So always tie back to the main project goal that you wanted to and see whether this approach, how, how does the details that you are now building and the contribution that you are proposing help you accomplish the main project goals. And finally, think about the significance, which is now what is the specific outcomes of this work? And this is something that should be measurable. And um, think about what are the measurable impacts that you can actually um, produce if you solve this problem and then also think about what the broader impacts are going to be for society who is going to use this what is it going to change what the fundamental change it is going to bring in a community think about this story and create a two-page draft that should be able to help you formalize your research idea into a narrative or a project story that you can then share with the program manager so as i said the second step is to find the home for a proposal in typical academic proposal, if you submit to the wrong program, it can actually doom a good proposal. So it's very important that you actually look into uh, these career or early career solicitations, which have multiple areas and programs, and try to figure out what is the right home for your proposal. And uh, then the second step is once you have identified the home for a proposal, send out these ideas to, to a specific program manager, reach out to the program manager and send out this two page story that you have developed and request for a call, request for a meeting or request for their feedback, right? It's always good to engage with the program manager for your first few proposals that you are writing, specifically the single PI one. And that will also help you understand better how well your pro proposal idea aligns with the programmatic and so solicitation requirement, and also help you build a relationship with the program manager, which is important for you to you know, eventually understand and follow up in future for you know, your proposals. So this is, I think, is one of the very crucial steps for you to find the right home and talk to the program manager. Once you have done that, then actually comes the real work where you have to write the proposal. And uh, this is a typical uh, format that you will find, uh, a typical documents that you will have to work on any proposal. Uh, some you know, multi-collaborative multi proposal could have more documents. Uh, some single PA proposal could have you know, fewer documents. But this is typically what you see. Most of the work that you will actually end up doing is in project description. Uh, rest of the things are a little bit boilerplate in some sense, and you can take help from your colleagues and your department. But this is the pace where you actually make most of your contribution and your creativity, innovation really reflects here. And uh, over time, you make you become bet better and better in that. So I'll briefly talk about what I mean by project description and how I think about it. Again, project description is something which is typically has a flexible structure. Um, this is a typical outline that you will see uh, in any, any of the proposals and main elements that you will have in uh, most of the proposals. So you'll have an introduction and overview that gives basically an overall idea of the project goals, innovation and impact and overview figure. So someone once reads your introduction and overview gets an instant idea that, okay, this is what they're trying to do. It looks like a compelling problem. And yes, I should read beyond three pages. That, that's what, what introduction and overview is. Then typically you will always have some element of related literature and preliminary results and prior work. This could be standalone section, but um, I typically combine them with the research thrust I introduced because it makes the readability a little bit easier. But uh, these elements have to be there for, for someone to understand what the prior art is, what you have done, and why this problem has a still not been solved, and how your research plan is going to solve this problem. So then comes the research plan, which is where you end up spending most of your time developing on each of the research thrusts that you are proposing, clearly describing what the goal is, what the overview is, what the approach is outcome and also some uh, discussion on risk and mitigation this is where you talk about individual thrust that you're proposing to address that overall research goal and as you can imagine this is again circular because these research thrusts should be tried together to address the main project goal that you're working with then you'll have a project management section and some broader uh, a section on broader impact that talks about what will be the general societal impact and edu maybe educational impacts also of your proposal and how and what is the 
main outcome as well as you talk about it here. Sometimes you also want to write milestones and outcomes depending upon the solicitation. Um, it, it, those are also a bit flexible for earlier, early career grants. But of course, re read the solicitation carefully to understand that. Some proposals, for example, NSF Career Grant has an education plan and they also want integration of research and education. That's an important criteria for NSF Career. Take help from your colleagues and, and dis discuss with the program manager if you have any questions about it. NSF typically also has a career workshop and it always is a good idea to attend them to understand what the program itself. It might, uh, uh, for early career grants, I have found that it also helped to integrate research beyond career and what are your long-term goals and how this project will help you achieve that goal. So that's a section that you can try to incorporate and that ties in your story, the story together that what you have done before, where you're going and how this project help you in, in, you know, in going towards the goal that you want to achieve in your career. So, um, Again, given the limited time, I'm going to very briefly talk about some of the main key points here. So, um, you know, uh, the, typically the, the point that I wanted to get across in project description that I have learned through writing again and again is basically uh, 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 adopt a layered approach of writing. What do I mean by that? Every section, for example, if someone reads an introduction and overview, they should get a idea about what is the need and motivation, a clear idea about what the need and motivations are, what are the research gap, what is what is you trying to do, what are the specific objectives, why your approach is creative, what is the innovation there, and what will be the significance and outcome of the approach, and why you are the right person to do that. So at the end of those two or three pages, the reviewer should be you know, excited about the project to read it more, under, uh, has a basic understanding of the project and why it's important, should be convinced that research is a great idea and will be looking for details in the next step. So that's the layer you are building. So you have kind of created a skeleton in introduction and overview, and then you start to progressively add more details as you go on. So then you go from overall idea to now build your research thrust and in your research thrust now you go and um, you know zoom in on, on basically those particular questions you're asking and start describing them in more details so that when reviewer reads that they understand okay that's what they were talking in introduction and that's how you know what they're proposing is going to help meet this particular goal and uh, that's how that's the creativity of their idea oh and they have done this prior work that makes sense when you're writing research thought it Trust, it also helps to have this kind of a structure. Start with a goal. What is the motivation? Ask what are the objectives? What is needed to achieve that goal? What is your method? And think about why it's creative, why it's innovative, why it's different from the existing work, and why it will be able to solve the problem that state of the art hasn't. And then think about what the outcomes are, which are measurable, and think about the impact, which should be transformative in the sense uh, of if you do these things, it should change something, right? Because you're solving a problem that has not been solved yet, and it's an important problem in your field. So think from this your particular you know, uh, structure and you might be able to construct a story that uh, basically is convincing for someone to understand why, how, and what will it do. So um, briefly, uh, some other uh, concepts, some other points here. Uh, collaborators are something uh, typically uh, early career uh, grants do not allow co-PIs, but you can still include collaborators to basically address some specific needs or gaps in expertise or to access of resources. For example, in NSF career, you have an educational portion of the grant, so you can in in involve some educational collaborator or someone to assess your educational goals. And you can also incorporate some uh, collaborator from a different discipline if you need some some help on some particular topics which you are not familiar with. You can also incorporate some collaborator from uh, from which you can, who can use facilities and equipment. For example, you can get some industry support letters to get data that you need to do your research. Um, you should, of course, clearly mention their role in the proposal. And typically, if they do not allow co-PIs, their role should not be a very significant one. In collaborative proposal, of course, you can help and figure out um, the, what, what co-PIs are needed or who you want to collaborate with to fill the gap. And uh, this, of course, uh, needs to have a cohesive research plan, which is leveraging the expertise of all the co-PIs. And you know, I can talk more about it um, if you have any questions. Then, as I said, get feedback, and I the, that's very important. Once your project uh, project uh, description, not overview, sorry. Once your project description is ready, uh, that's first draft. Get feedback from your collaborators, peers, and mentor. 
for your first few single pi proposal this is something i strongly recommend at least try to you know recruit three reviewers who have the time and the motivation to provide you a very honest feedback on your on your draft consider reviewers from different career stages associate professor full professor professors from different but related disciplines to get different perspective um uh, figure out what specific questions you want to ask them read the merit review criteria and construct the question that did they found the proposal clear and compelling uh, did it made a strong case to do this research and why you should be doing the research it was was it able to make that that you know strong compelling case did the project included the sufficient detail on research plan and its feasibility so you know read the merit review criteria and ask your reviewer that did they how will they answer it will they fund it based on these criteria or not and if not what 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 is you can do to address those challenges now i do want to add this that multiple feedback may be confusing and at the end you are the best judge of your work so see through the feedback and include the ones that you find constructive and you know have confidence of course in your work then uh, very briefly you do need to construct other proposal document and it helps to get started on it on this sooner take help from your department and colleagues on this particular proposal document carefully read the funding announcement to figure out what is needed what is the page limit for these and then um, you know um, if you have some examples from from some of your colleagues then you can figure out how you can adapt it for your particular um, uh, for your, for your particular proposal but these are most of the um, most of the proposal most of the calls have these and you should be able to find some help along these lines but if you do have any questions about any of these i can talk more uh that's typically the full stage of you know getting to a full proposal writing uh sorry i, I mentioned here you of course need to iterate based on the feedback what you get and include the ones that you find more constructive and you know revise accordingly and then of course prepare all the list of you know um supporting documents make sure that all the supporting documents are uh, properly formatted and of course are within the page limit that the funding agency is asking for and submit on or uh, basically before time so that you have enough time to actually uh, revise something if something is not correct that's pretty much the whole process for academic uh, proposal writing i can of course ask more uh, answer more questions if you have on any of those topics briefly i also wanted to uh, mention what are the funding opportunities available both for the graduate student as well as for the early faculty um i have made a list of those in in next couple of slides and also included some useful links these list are of course not exhaustive but you can find a lot of the information in several university website your university websites as well as um some you know online resources are are proliferate in this prolific in this particular uh topic but um do talk to your um um research office do talk to your um fellowship program within the university to figure out what other opportunities you might have universities might have a specifically a specific department uh, related fellowships that that you can take advantage of try to apply for them likewise for early career faculty there are some uh, these are some of the early career awards from various agencies uh, typically they have uh, almost similar time the, the, the deadlines are almost at the same time during the years and you can find if you google them you can actually find the information about the upcoming funding opportunity or the past funding opportunity for any of these programs you can also find information about what has been funded before and that is also helpful other thing could be that even if the deadline is you know before even deadline before you start to plan you may want to uh, reach out to the program manager and say that hey I, i i want to talk about my my work and i want to discuss my project with you and maybe you can schedule a call you can schedule a, a visit and actually talk to the program managers wherever you want to direct your proposal to finally this is my last slide and i just wanted to give you some key takeaways from 7 years of writing and mostly failing but occasionally succeeding on these funding uh, or the proposals select a compelling idea in which you have prior expertise and that will advance your field definitely definitely check your assumptions and the best way to check your assumptions are to discuss your idea with different experts from academia from industry from national labs try to you know uh, get a um, um, get a sense of what you are assuming and and what has been done so far um find opportunities to speak about your research it's important to get your presence known in the community so that people know what you do and why you are because these are the people who, who will be reviewing your proposal so it it helps for them to know your work ahead of time 
uh, you must talk to program manager. Uh, that's something I would recommend that must talk to program managers and uh, for early career grants. For others, try to attend informational webinars. Um, get invited for an NSF proposal review. This might be a bit tricky if you already don't have a funding, but still talk to program manager, develop some relationship and say that basically tell them that you are interested in proposal review. And, uh, you know, um, and maybe they will have an opportunity for you to be invited for proposal review. This is crucial because it helps you understand the review process and helps you understand that how the merit review criteria is evaluated by the reviewers. Um, reach out to your colleagues for example proposals. This is a good idea, specifically for your first few single PA grants. This helps you understand, uh, um, you know, um, how an idea has been developed. And this is, I, I think, this 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 is helpful. Again, a picture is worth a thousand words. Create good pictures to explain the overall idea or overview overview of your proposal. Try to have at least one picture per page. This was the recommendation when I was writing early career proposal. But I mean, one one picture per thrust is also OK. Get feedback. Uh, that's also important. Discuss with your mentor and, uh, you know, uh, get feedback um, from your community and, you know, check your assumptions again and again as you're working on your problem. Finally, failures are inevitable. Do not, I mean, you will fail more often than you will succeed. At least I have failed more often than I have succeeded. Keep trying. The good news is that in academic world, your failures teach you more than your successes. So it's a, it's a good idea. It's, it's a good thing to fail, basically. And you learn a lot more. And finally, wish you all the best with your academic journey. And that's all for me. Thank you so much, Dr. Dubey. That was quite a robust session detailing step by step the process in the academic proposal writing. So we're going to take the second speaker and then we'll have the Q&A session afterwards, if that's OK. Yep, sounds great. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. And so now I have the great honor of introducing our very second speaker for today. And she will be presenting on entrepreneurship and writing a successful industry grant proposal. Ms. Rika Sharma has over 15 years of experience in energy markets, grid reliability, transmission and distribution, power plant design across companies like California ISO, Liberty Utilities, ABB Inc., and Siemens AG. She is the founder of Software X Inc. and leads innovation and strategy. As an energy SME, she is actively involved in designing the in house software products. In previous roles, she has managed development of energy market and grid reliability, along with integrating energy storage, renewables in solar and wind to the Western um, American grid. She has developed applications like mesh short circuit, Volvo optimization in network management suites, energy management, distribution management, outage management, and SCADA. As part of Siemens engineering team, she designed multiple gas coal power plants and led the engineering efforts of nuclear facilities. She has masters in electrical engineering from Texas A&M University as well as bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Delhi College of Engineering and an MBA degree from Rotman School of Management. Thank you so much for being here today with us, Ms. Sharma. Can you see my screen? You guys can see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see your screen. All right. OK, so I think before I go there, um, hi, everyone, and thank you for you know having this time. I want to understand uh, you know, who, who all are in this, um, in this chat. So I want to do a poll. Uh, uh, how do I do that? So, so there is a poll. Do you guys see that? Or it's still in private chat. 
Um, so we're live streaming across um, social media platforms. So that might be difficult to do here. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so we have this. mostly um, young professionals in, um, I mean, comprising of students, graduate students, as well as um, industry professionals. All right. So I had only two questions. One is, are you a student? Or And the second question was, are you planning to start a company in the near future? So uh, based on that, you know, that's where I go deep, right? All right. Okay. So, so we posted the, um, the link in the chat um, and participants can you know, click on that and then um, do the poll. I, I did that. Do you see? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I've created the poll. If you guys can see, but it's okay. Let it be for some other day. I'm assuming most are young professionals. They are more than 50% are students and hopefully they want to start a company in your future. And right. Based on that assumption, I will start speaking. And I'm glad uh, uh, Professor you know, Anamika had uh, spoken in depth on, you can see my screen with the slide deck? Yes, we can see your screen. All right. Thank you. So uh, what I'll go through is probably complementary of what you know, uh, Professor Anamika spoke, because uh, when you start thinking of funding and grants as an entrepreneur, you have so many options. And uh, the time is running faster. Like, you know, when you're probably in academia, you know, of course, it means your priorities are different than when you are in the, in the industry. So I'll probably share my journey as, as an entrepreneur and where the grants came in handy and where they were... Uh, they were probably uh, slower than what I felt and there was other options for me. So just kind of giving you the whole whole bucket of uh, funding which is available and focusing on the grant. So that's where I will be talking about. So a little bit about myself, of course, means uh, I'm electrical engineer, master's in electrical engineer, did some work in the industry and all that thing, you know, and I write it down myself right so that's the first thing I did uh, the second thing is what my company is now assume that you're starting a company you should know what you're building why you're building it who's your customer so this whole business design and ideation phase that you have to do before you start you know thinking about any kind of funding because you generally ask for money uh, for a particular thing. So you should be able to define that particular thing. And that's what comes in in your, in your business design. Like what's your idea? Who's your customer? Why that person would buy your uh, product versus someone else's product? So your unique pro uh, proposition, your value proposition, and what is the scope? So for a successful business, you should have an immediate need. And also there should be a scaling up uh, opportunity that uh, the demand is going to increase so what are the what are the proof that you know you see an increasing demand so all these things in whichever business you are uh, you know you're starting you have to do these uh, the, these few evaluations before you actually take a plunge and then define your company what you do and why you're doing it who's your customer everything in one line in your in your one sentence introduction. So for SolveRx, it's a clean tech firm. It's focusing on creating intelligent solutions, AI-based in the field of energy, and we make product uh, for our system. So it's just one line, and I've highlighted a few uh, words in that, and you'll understand why I've highlighted, but just take it as, you know, as a picture value. This is just two sentences written, and Rekha has highlighted a few things. Uh, clean tech, energy, AI, emissions, EV integration, renewable, making it smoother. So these are the things that uh, that are going to be key ingredients in your grant uh, grant writing or any kind of funding uh, application. So that's the start. Now, as I said, that I wrote my resume, I wrote my company's resume, and then let's see what I where I stand out. Right. So this is the strategy part that I want to understand. Who am I? Uh, I'm an engineer, I'm a woman, young engineer, visible minority, 
there might be some things which are you know special for an MBA engineer, uh, some diversity inclusion. So all these things can actually help me stand out in the application. And again, I want to uh, emphasize that each each of these factors might lead you to a grant. Uh, because as an industry, you don't need only a research grant. You might need different, different things, and they are available through government or through private sector. But there are a lot of them available in government itself where you don't have to lose your equity. Um, so now that you understand your business, you understand yourself, you, uh, you know, you've kind of made a profile for yourself uh, that that government might have uh, some, some funding in that area, make a big exhaustive link, uh, you know, list of what kind of research are there. And I think this is very important for, a, for an entrepreneur because you need to navigate to the, the lowest hanging fruit earliest because you will not have any credibility when you start because you're not a functioning company, you're just an ideation. So there are a lot of grants which come in at a later stage and you should know what is what from the beginning so that you don't waste time in applying on something that needs three years of experience for a company, right? So of course, you're gonna get three years of experience only after three years that you've been functioning. So like make a full list. So let's just take, spend some time here. There are some fully funded research grants, right? Uh, something what uh, academy I do, like they just write a full detail application, government gives them money and they take uh, three years or maybe five years sometimes to develop that whole product. And you're just solely working on that. And then there are some co-funded research. What is that co-funded research? That you might be an industry partner, there might be some financial uh, like partner and government puts in 50%. So there'll be 50% contribution from the government, 50% either you pay it out of your pocket or there is a financial private funding coming in and you're the technology partner there. And in total, you get your finance and you you are the technical lead in that in that co-funded research. There are some zero interest lo uh, loans also that you, you're so sure that you are going to take this money, work on it for six months. And in six months, the money will start pouring in because you're, you'll commercialize your product. And that's when you can return the money to the government. And there are some you know financial institution which works with government to give that kind of loans. Uh, and then there are some as I said, uh, like some partnership grants where it's never like government will never fund to one person. It has to come in a in a combination. What is an ideal combination? It could be a utility, which would be uh, eventually a customer of your product, uh, a startup, which is, for example, start solve for X. And then there is this com uh, government you know body which is involved. So it's partnership. It's I means uh, government will not get to either of them if they apply individually, but together it's a best team to work on it. Like we will be developing the technology, utility will be testing hand in hand as we progress, like, you know, we, we go feature by feature. Utility stand tall, but the motivation for them uh, is that they want to eventually uh, use that project for them, you know, for for their use. So that's the that's the reason they will partner with that. And eventually, when you when you develop that, let's say it takes you three years to develop that uh, product, you can commercialize to other utilities, which will be just a pure business. Uh, there are a lot of grants for hiring and training, and uh, there are some IP grants. And I when I said that go for the lowest hanging fruits, these were the things which came in very easy for me where we just had to show that we are a startup and government actually fund uh, young professionals who are maybe first year, second year, third year engineering student. They want some internships. They want to try uh, and, you know, like try their hand in a real company, not only uh, the educational coursework. So uh, they get internship and we get the job done uh, but and government pays for it so that way it's really helpful for a startup that you don't have to hire 10 people you are just getting the work done and government is hiring uh, young professionals for you 
so they come in very handy the other are ip grants like for a company you when you are doing a research you want to protect either through patents or some trade secrets some um, you know there are list of uh, intel uh, ip uh, that you can create and there are some ip grants just talking to a lawyer is 500 dollars per hour so for a startup to actually have a have a lawyer on board comes in at a cost so if you get ip grants you can fund those meetings with the lawyers there are other ways also and i'll talk about it as i go but these are all types of grants so uh, that's where i feel a uh, big difference between industry grant and the otherwise because we have a big pool and that's what makes it more confusing more opportunity but more confusing and that's where you should know which ones are the lowest hanging and take them first which ones are more difficult but this is the time so there are time and effort and it just differs so we need to be very judicious on where we are putting our energy and time because uh for startup i felt that things have to be done really fast so every month and every six months that you're wasting on something actually costing you a, your company because if you just keep doing these for a few years uh, there are high chances that people will stop believing in your product and you will not probably scale up when you actually need 1 billion dollar kind of funding later on so uh Uh, and you should get familiarized with all these words like you know what is this cyber award uh, sbir award these are the fully funded ones what is doe the, uh, what is the nsf and nserc in canada all these terms people spoke to me about in these acronyms and for me i had to understand what is this rfp uh, what is this you know expression of interest and how do i uh, fill up that form so just getting to know each of this and how difficult each of this is a lot of work in itself so first things first you get familiarized with the whole pool which is available to you and then i kind of shortlisted the things that um, that i am eligible to at a, any point of time and what actually uh, is easy for me to do like for example getting this co funded research grant it was nightmare because i didn't know any uh, any other partner who want to partner with me without any proof uh, so i just stuck on the things which were easy and applicable for me and i just went there and now i think we are almost at a stage that i can do these partnership projects but two years back that was not the right time so um and this is uh, the next thing is i want to talk about this incubators and accelerators out there there are lots of them out there in the market and you should be very vigilant on what you're what you're signing up for so uh and the good thing is there are some government run uh, incubators and there are some private run incubators so let's just talk about the government run incubators first uh so the good thing is they will be run by government they will be funded by them so uh, their motivation to uh be engaged with you is because they are getting funding from fred and it's their job to actually help companies like yours to to flourish so just to give you some example apri has this incubatory every year that you know i think they select 30 startups every year and they kind of uh, they kind of help you make your product to the next level and uh, mass district is there in toronto right now and each i i feel right now in each country and each state and each city will have one and you have to find the one which applies to you these four are the one which applied to me and i got engaged with them and i've i've learned a lot like just getting those connections and meetings with the utility was a nightmare for me and like uh like innovation factory and invest out well i was talking to the ceo of another company by just expressing the interest you know to the person let's say in invest out well like i want to talk to this this company and they set up the meeting for me that itself is a big win for a person who's trying to set up a startup uh, and then they guide you through all these things even if it is uh, some government funding coming in they will apprise you with that and you know they have newsletters that they keep on circulating and you get to know you get to know what's what's coming in from fed from provincial from state level which applies to you and then you go for it uh the same thing applies for private but then there are some 
which takes equity, which is like 7% or 5% of your company right from the beginning. Uh, some do help, some do not. Uh, I've just put in like top three that I searched. Of course, like anyone who starts a startup has heard of this Y Combinators, Techstars. They are good in certain way and not good in certain way. And you have to understand what is your positioning. Uh, I did not apply there because my clients were mainly commercial clients, very regulated industry. So going to Y Combinator may not give me that kind of push from the beginning. Once I'm a little bit established, maybe five years, uh, you know, incorporated, I might just go there because they have a lot of capital available, right? So they can sign me a $500 million check in without in, like blink of an eye. Uh, so that's where I would be probably approaching. But then everyone on its own in this journey of entrepreneurship, the case that apply to me may not apply to you. So have these in mind, try to understand what, each of these incubators can do for you and uh, uh, are you at the right stage that you should be engaging with them or not uh, and there are some even the private ones which are not taking any equity people do sign up in those that okay this uh, this this incubator is not taking any equity so i have nothing to lose there is one thing that you lose which is time and for a startup it is it is like gold you don't have to waste like even one month in an incubator if it's not useful. So signing up in any incubator, you should understand what is their track record, what they have done uh, to other startups in your field. Do they have experts which can, uh, you know, who can uh, guide you through? Like if there is an expert in some aeronautical industry and I'm a clean tech, what guidance? Like he might be an expert in his industry, but can he can he or she guide me? Uh, probably not. So why do I waste his time or her time and my time? So don't sign up on just an incubator because they, they're coming in without any equity. Find the one which is applicable to your industry, has the best tra track record and then go. There is one more thing that many of the entrepreneurs do. They do go for this pitch contest. And I decided from the very beginning that I'm not going to do that because it just it comes in very easy for any MBA student to go and talk and they can make awesome presentations and they win those pitch contests and they just keep doing it for one, two years. But did they focus on making a good uh, product? Uh, I don't want to get distracted on that. I'm not saying that I'll never go into a pitch competition, but uh, uh, I don't want that to be my primary criteria. But I have some entrepreneur friends who have done that. They have won prizes like $50,000, you know, $100,000 there. So that's something uh, can give you some cash in the beginning and which can come, come in handy. Now, now that I have given you this whole portfolio of all the options which are available for you, there comes this detailed cycle of writing each grant. And because we have so many options, uh, the ta it means there is no one rule book I could make for myself. Like IP grant or uh, hiring grant was so different than these government research grants. So for me, I just uh, shortlisted the list, which was you know, uh, what is the funding plan that I have for myself? I signed up on Pocketed and any newsletter from the government websites that can just tell me, you know, when this application started. And then I had to take each application uh, individually. So, of course, you have to understand what they're asking for. Uh, do or do due diligence when you're writing a grant that why they would give you a grant and try to be that. And like don't uh, don't like force yourself to be that. If you're not that, then that you're never gonna get that grant. To be honest, like if you if there is a match, then only the grant invigilator or whoever the selector committee is gonna give you the grant. So uh, the the primary question is uh, written there in the requirements. You have to read it very carefully and understand if there is a match and you can prove it, then you know you can go. Uh, you can go start writing the whole detail application and I'm sure uh, you know the the previous speakers spoke about it in very different thing but uh, for an industry grant there has to be a need of commercialization that's that's one thing you have to always remember so I think I'll stop at that uh, as I said like you can reach out to me uh, follow us on you know LinkedIn and Insta if you want some uh, updates on Solforex uh, there is a hello at solforexinc.com you can just put in put in like, you know, speak with Rekha, like need an appointment and it will be set up for you. Go to our website. There is a contact page that you can again 
go and uh, you know request a meeting with me uh, if you want and i think i'll stop here i see the time is getting up uh, but uh, open uh, back to at time Thank you so much, um, Mr. Sharma. That was really, really insightful. Um, so right now we've come to the Q&A section. I'm going to be adding Dr. Dubey to the stream. Uh, for everyone streaming on the um, different social media platforms, kindly put your questions in the chat um, and they will be addressed right now. Um, but as we're waiting for the questions, I have some questions um, that I would like to ask our panelists. So um, Dr. Dube, with regards to the um, academic proposal writing, right? Um, when we talk about novelty in a research idea, um, does it absolutely mean that it has to be a completely new idea that no one has ever done before? Or is it okay to maybe build on an existing uh, proposal research, and if we can build on an existing proposal, to what extent or um, how can we, you know, ensure that there's still a distinction between that existing research proposal idea and this new um, proposal idea that we're working on? Great question. And I struggled with this question for uh, several years in the beginning of proposal writing, specifically academic proposal writing. Everyone struggles with that idea. The, the key point that I have understood through the process is, of course, you're building on some existing research. We are in engineering discipline and uh, we are not reinventing the wheel. So you will be working on something that has already been done. But the basic question you should be asking is that why uh, it, the, the problem that you're First of all, the problem you are asking, has it been solved? Has it been fully solved? And the question is, if it hasn't been fully solved, what is it that is missing? Is it some implementation detail that is missing? Is it some uh, fundamental understanding that is missing? Is it fundamental you know, um, development effort that is missing? And that help you figure out and construct the proposals for specific agencies. That's how you think about it. So for example, for NSF, if you think about it, the question should be that, yes, there is a basic and fundamental understanding that is missing. So for example, if we want to understand how does the climate change is going to affect our grid, right? Of course, we're not starting from fundamentals, but the question is, do we know the model for the climate changes, right? Do we do we know the model for how they affect the power grid? How do we construct that model? What kind of fundamental, you know, data sources are needed to construct that model? What, what kind of, you know, analysis is needed to construct that model? And then once you think about that, you go down the rabbit hole of thinking about that, you basically realize that, aha, that there is a this, this thing that is missing. This is a fundamental knowledge creation that is missing. That's how you start building on it. Definitely people would have worked on this problem. This is something that you will not find new. But then you can go a little bit deeper in your, you know, trust description descriptions why the existing approaches are not sufficient. Maybe they are not using all the data that is needed to be used. Maybe they're not constructing the accurate enough models, right? So when, once you start actually going down, you know, this thought process, you will start to see that, okay, this is how the fundamental understanding is missing. In some ideas, maybe it's not the fundamental understanding that is missing. It's more about the really thinking through the problem, putting all the concepts together and building a, a prototype that actually flows through the models, right? That may be a good for a different agency, but that still is a, you know, you know and creation from the perspective of proposal writing, right? So that's why I said that read through the merit review criteria and think about what is missing. And then you will you will be able to answer that. I, I hope I answered your question. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I would also like to hear um, Ms. Sharma's perspective on that same question from the industry um, perspective. Yeah, I think from industry perspective, you can have competitors. Uh, which might be giving you a, like, you know, there might be two competitors which have a very similar product, but then the value proposition has to be unique. Like uh, just very basic thing, right? Like you have YouTube and you have TikTok and you have, uh, uh, you have Facebook. Why someone would go one or the other, right? Like, uh, is it ease? It is just the way a person feels about that product can make a lot of changes. So the backside research could be very same, but then just the look and feel can actually change the whole game. So uh, one thing you cannot do is you cannot breach the IP. Like if someone holds the IP, like a patent to that, you cannot just do, you, you cannot just create it. So that IP protects that person to do. But then 
it's always good to have competitors in business that uh, people can actually a it it validates that there is a need of that and b that people can choose and uh, if your product is good it will it will be successful so uh, never breach an ip but then if it's close competition uh, that's a good thing i would say awesome thank you so much and um speaking on ip i'm just going to um you know, piggyback off of what you were talking about regarding the intellectual property. So say, for instance, um, a professional, you know, um, you know, wrote a proposal, but at the end of the day, the proposal does not get granted. How does this person ensure that his IP is protected and it's not stolen? Uh, this question for me? Yes, please. Okay, I can do that means uh, I've met with some very successful, you know, uh, people in the industry, and there was a paper uh, that it just went on, I think, a review, and it got some rave reviews. Like, you know, it was like before the world. I'm not taking any names or anything here, but then it it got attention from the industry. So what that author did was first file patents, and then they actually, uh, you know even you know put the paper out there for publication so uh, if you put the paper out there if you put just your whole source then you cannot actually go back and ip it if, if someone ips it before so that's you have to protect your ip the first thing uh, okay. right and uh, then you go about it okay thank you that's an outstanding advice um Okay, so I'm still monitoring the chat to check for questions, but I have another question for um, Dr. Dubé. Okay, so uh, what are some tips that you would give a young faculty who is just starting out on how to identify, you know, copies to collaborate with in a proposal? Um, how do you identify? How do you also decide who should be, you know, the lead PI versus the co-PI? Um, yeah, what's the process for that? Okay, so um, let me try to speak through experience. So first thing you want to do, and maybe this is just me, but and maybe you know it's unsolicited advice, take one year to just think about what you want to do. What is the research? What are, what are your career goals? What do you really want to accomplish as a research? I'm not saying, saying that just think about it. I'm just saying that start writing, of course, but mostly focus on those single PI proposals that you want to get out. The single thing, what, what, what distinguishes you as a faculty, right? Start thinking about those things first. Where is your home? And of course, that should build on the fact what you have done before, because that's really where your expertise are. And I understand, of course, PhD is a very, very narrow area. I mean, but you have to expand from there, right? That's, that's what my recommendation will be to expand from your PhD area. You can choose to, of course, pick a different area as well altogether. And that's a good idea if you think that's a, that's a great idea to, you know, discipline to work on. And the re But you have to do the legwork then. Work for a couple of years, get some publications done on that, build your expertise in that area, and then start writing proposals for yourself. That's what I would say to start as you start working on, you know, early, early career, um, first couple of years. Mm -hmm. Now, after you have understood where your home is, the next step for you to do is, okay, this is my career goal. This is what I want to do. These are the co like larger funding opportunities that are coming up, right? Which I probably want to write because they align with my goal somehow. I don't have all the expertise to really work on it. Um, am I, do I have expertise to uh, address the calls question? That's the first question to ask. If I don't, then it's just someone else has, and maybe I can contribute to that. So that's how you choose who is going to be lead, who is going to be co-PI in early in your, in your career. As you start to develop more and more expertise, you can then ask yourself, okay, does it make sense for me to lead it? Because now I have expertise in all the things that they're asking for. And now I can uh, take help from other co-PIs who can add to this expertise or this, this set of, you know, um, the technology that I'm bringing. So, you know, this really depends upon as it it's an evolutionary process. You evolve through that. Initially, you will start working with um, seeing some of these funding opportunity and seeing your, your goals align with, align with that. You form and join the teams. You go and reach out to people and see whether they are, you know, looking for it. Other thing could also be that you actually find that, yes, this is a funding opportunity you want to address and you want to write a collaborative proposal. Great. Go and find out who are the experts in your area who might help you in, in actually writing a nice collaborative proposal that is leveraging all the, all the expertise. And uh, again, as I, as I say, be bold, be clear on your goals, go and reach out to people. Uh, you know, uh, 
that that's one thing the, that's the first thing to do if you find someone who is really really appropriate to to serve as a copia in your area based on of course their profile and you know academic profiles are always available just you know ping them call them email um, call them is not not there anymore e email them right so <laughs> email them ping them on linkedin figure out what they want to do and if it works out great if it doesn't work out that's fine try to meet them in conferences make yourself visible in that one year so that you know people and people know you and that's how you start to you know look and shift through the funding opportunities and start building those collaborative proposals i think i'm blab a little bit digressing from the question but but it's a process really to to you know put together a team and also figure out what is suitable for you as a lead versus copia but one thing keep your career goal in mind and make sure whatever you are responding to whatever funding opportunity you are responding to aligns with that career goal because you will have a very limited time as an early career faculty you'll be doing 100 different things and you'll be learning 100 different things at the same time so make sure that you are targeted you are focused and you are actually applying to those particular you know grants that you think is important for your career in development of that particular expertise that you want Awesome. Thank you so much. So I'm still going to kind of tweak the question a little bit for um, Ms. Sharma. So it seems like in academia, um, the process of finding, you know, partners or collaborators is um, up to the, you know, the faculty or the person who is writing the proposal. In industry, is there any um, opportunity or, yeah, is there any way for um, partners to actually be paired up by the grant givers or most, um, you know, partners find their partners, you know, by themselves. Yeah. I think the journey is as painful as it is for maybe uh, Anamika. It is a process. Uh, last year, there was a good project very, very close to uh, me, but I just started off. I just didn't know anyone and I lost that. This year, somebody knocked through LinkedIn and said, we want to talk. And then we we actually set up a proposal together. The best uh, proposals that I've written is uh, an industry partner and uh, an academic partner, right? But those are the things that for, for a business person, it's not my immediate product. Because as, a, as an industry, like you have this product, which is already on the floor and you're like, you know, you're engaging with your customers. They would need like, tomorrow every week i have something to something to show my customers right and there are always some things that i want to build maybe in 5 years from now those are the things that i want to engage uh, with the with the professor with the industry uh, sorry with the with academia because they have all the expertise they have the best people you know uh, to work on like masters and even phd's working on that with all the capabilities we as industry provide our industrial knowledge our people like because i can just give you an example the 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 industry like again not taking any names but this proposal that we just signed in uh, there is a good uh, academic knowledge uh, from the professor they know and then there's going to be so much software which will be required there because our product is so futuristic. It's all AI and machine learning. Like all those components, like all those skills may not be in that one, one team, right? So if my academic partner is awesome in the power system, I can build a team for machine learning in my group, like in R&D, and we work together, right? So we might work together for three years and make something amazing out of it and then try to commercialize. The commercialized aspect becomes very promising when you have an industry partner because we are already engaging with customers and we do our due like market research and all those things before signing up anything. Uh, I've done an SF project when I was doing my thesis as a student. Uh, I don't know. that <laughs> It's been like 12 years. I don't know if it is commercialized or not. On the other side, if you are an industry partner and an academic partner, after three years, an industry partner will put all their expertise to commercialize it, right? So I don't know if I got digressed and got carried away in the answer. Uh, the process is no easy. You have to uh, talk to people. Like right now, I am spending one hour talking to three of you. So many people are listening to me. So they know that I am open to these kind of you know, research projects, uh, go to your, uh, you know, conferences, give talks. Like I, I taught in a university for free for six months because I wanted to get a good understanding with the professor because 
if I am getting into those research grant kind of projects, it's three-year marriage with that person, right? Like you are working day in, day out, tough uh, calls, tough projects. So you you have to have a camaraderie as, as partners, right? As research partners. So getting to know more people in the industry is very crucial. And for me, like whatever my profile is, I was in state where I was handling energy markets. Purposefully, I did not speak to many people because what if by mistake there is a somebody who wants to trade and I by mistake say something, right? So I like it's the billion million dollars per minute market. So and I knew all the insights of Western electricity market. Like what is the LMP coming out in next five minutes? I know that, right? So so I myself cut off from the industry for almost eight years. Uh, but then as an entrepreneur, it's exactly opposite. I should be out there talking to more people, talking to customers, talking to just, you know, the people who I was trying to like shy away. I have to go talk to them. So uh, it was, means I would say like for me, last two, three years, that's all I did. Like just be out there, talk to people, make, uh, make, make good associations, right? So, it may not be fruitful today, but five years from now, if that projects come in and there is a DOE funding, that person will remember you and they will call you, right? So you should be very, very malleable in that way that you don't, you don't go and talk just for one purpose. You just go talk. You're out there. People know what you're doing. People know you're open to these kind of research projects. People know what your financial backing is, right? Like, can you bring in some... Because, uh, as I said, the grants are 100%, but there are uh, there are some grants that need at least 25% private equity. Can I give that or not? Do I have financial partners who can actually fund that project for me? So all these things, you have to do a lot of groundwork. And it's just, although we are working online, it's still person to person. If you meet a person, it's very important. Uh, if you can at least talk to them through a Zoom, it's very important. I generally don't add just people on my LinkedIn, just like that, I have I have to have a uh, like you know some meeting with them, and then I, I I remember. So all my let's say top 100 200 people that will be probably my partners, I've spoken to them either personally or through Zoom at least once in last one year. That's that's the relation I maintain. So it's a lot of work, a lot of time on your hand that you have to give in to uh, socialize in your network, but I think that's what it takes. That's really profound. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Sharma. We're really running out of time, but I see a question here from a participant. I believe this is for Dr. Dubey. The question says, for academia, can you come up with a research that the school or so did not publish? So I think he's asking, um, when you're coming up with a research idea, can you, um, you know, leverage on a research that your school already has, but has, that has not been published. Oh, yes, absolutely. You can always leverage on that, that you can include, you should include, in fact, uh, that I have learned uh, through several failures, that you should include some preliminary results in your proposal. And uh, those should be convincing, those should build on your prior work, but you can include always a small example case that showcases how your approach works. So you can, you, you should include unpublished work as well, uh, but not in the sense of, you know, referencing it, but more in the sense of communicating your idea in, in the proposal. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then I have a question um, that I would like to ask Dr. Dubey. You touched a little bit on this when you were talking, but um, with regards to the aspect of um, failing, I mean, I know the title of this um, webinar is actually writing a successful <laughs> proposal, but you mentioned that, you know, failure is inevitable. So can you please touch a little bit on that? Um, how can, you know, a faculty ensure that they fail forward? Meaning how do they ensure that they do not take failure personally? How can they learn from the failed experiences and make sure that, you know, they leverage on that and um, yeah, just build up on that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I'll give you an example. So um, again, failure is inevitable. As a student, you also know how many papers you uh, you have got that got declined, how many you know horrible reviews you have seen, and how many response letters you have written. Right? Never take it personally. That's something of a mantra that you should always have. I mean, it's 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 just. 
you know it, it's not a comment on you it's a, it's 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 it, i mean you are in a very competitive field it is just the way it is right there are so many smart people you're working with you know the 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 gist that i learned over 6 years of mostly failing and that was what the last slide was is that you will learn more from your failures than you will learn from your success this is the rule and you should i mean in a way it's lucky to fail let me put it a very in a simple sense so once you start to you know understand it and and you know adapt that and i'm not saying that you know start reveling in your failures i'm just saying that you know you you learn from your failures and that's really an opportunity for you to grow and actually you know think about um, yourself think about where your assumptions went wrong think about what you should do to really make this a success right so always always bounce back as i say be resilient that's the most important thing that 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 is needed when you are in this field and it's very rewarding it professionally is very rewarding for you when you actually fail and grow from there now how you do that there are of course practical ways of doing it for example let's say your nsf career proposal got declined you will get a list of reviews on what was what was said in that like any paper reviews those reviews are also very confusing and convoluted at times sit down with the program manager try to find a time with them and ask them that what went on in the discussion mm -hmm. try to understand where is the real challenge here and then you know take a step back think about it uh, and and figure out how you can improve right that's that's the that's the goal the second thing i would highly highly recommend and this very much helps in the, you know this competitive environment have a very strong network of mentors and collaborators this is very important have mentors within your university have mentors outside of your universities um have mentors from different you know um state uh, uh, different um paths or different stages of career uh talk to these mentors they will be able to walk you through their journey and you will understand that you're not alone this happens to everyone and they will also help you figure out how to really maneuver through this you know path and everyone has this journey to go through to you know to to grow as an academic academic professional so what i would say is that if you are going to take high risk you will have high probability of failing but you also will get high rewards so you know learn to fall um smoothly and learn to figure out how to bounce back and that that requires you know having a great, great great set of mentors around you to really work through it learning through your mistake thinking logically about your about your you know assumptions and and re reevaluating them um basically making progress along the lines and and you know keep checking your 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 assumptions and that requires again as as rick also sa said uh, engaging with the community go talk go discuss you know be, make yourself vulnerable to failures that's kind of what i would say thank you so much i think this is a great place to stop because we're actually way out of time right now thank you so much for being here um dr dubey and ms sharma really really a pleasure spending this afternoon with you thank you to all of our participants for being here with us today all right thank you bye thank you ade and uh, it was pleasure meeting you rekha as well and i had a lot of fun thank you everyone thank you nice meeting bye